Now, if you uh, want to, you can turn to Glendian's outline. It has some scripture. Now, I'm sure I can't do justice to it, but uh, uh, we will be using some of the thoughts in it. But I want to change the topic a little bit. <clears throat> And the topic that I will choose will include his. Jesus uh, does want to be seen. God does want to be seen. But the topic that I'm going to take is, was Jesus nuts? <laughs> and I just remind you of the scripture that you heard last evening from the Sermon on the Mount and other things. And we'll look at a story or two here. But uh, you know what Jesus said to us in essence, especially if you come down to the last part of the sixth chapter of Matthew was that this world is a perfectly safe place for us to be. It's a perfectly safe place for us to be. And that if we will simply place ourselves in his hand, no harm can come to us. Now harm isn't exactly the same thing as hurt. We're still vulnerable, but no harm can come to us. And if that isn't enough to make you wonder whether or not Jesus was nuts, maybe you haven't been in the real world. <laughs> but uh, that's what he was saying. And he was just saying, look, how God has arranged everything. God has arranged a world in which everything is taken care of in its own way. Um, and um, do you not believe that God has made provision for you? See, so that's the invitation of Jesus is for us to see God as perfectly in control of the world and allowing what comes to pass in it to come to pass because at least in the long run it is a good thing. And not taken separately. You know, Romans 28, 828 does not say that everything is good. It says that all things work together for good. And it doesn't say that for everyone. It says it works together for good for those who love God and are called into his purposes. Everything works together for good. But you see, the idea is this. Everyone is invited to the party. Everyone can come. Everyone can love God. Everyone can be called according to his purposes. Everyone was made to fit into those purposes. Jesus says in Matthew 25, Come, you blessed, my fa blessed of my Father, and receive the kingdom which was prepared for you from the foundation of the world. See, every one of us sitting here today, standing here, was foreseen by God. And when it was time for you to be conceived and born into this world, God in effect said, now it's time for you. It's time for Don or Levon or Bob or Emily or whoever it is. It's, now it's, time, for, it's time for you to come in. So he had planned on that. Now is your time. And your time here on earth is a time when we're, le when we're uh, learning to reign with him in our actual lives. And everything that you see in the spiritual life is an opportunity to learn how to do that. How to reign with God in our actual lives. This is training for reigning. That's what your life is all about. It's training for reigning, training in reigning. People often wonder why there's such a strange arrangement as prayer. Well, that's so that we can learn how to reign with God in our lives, you see. And God has to be cautious with that. He doesn't want to give us what we can't stand. He wants us to grow and to seek and to learn to come to that place to where it's perfectly safe for him to answer our prayers. Because, you see, his objective for us is that we should become the kind of person that he could empower to do what we want. 
No, I didn't make a mistake there. You may have been waiting for me to say that we can do what God wants. But I'll say it again. He is developing us to be the kinds of persons that he can empower to do what we want. See, that's much greater to be able to bring a free being, a human being, to the point to where they can be empowered to do what they want. Now, I don't know how many of you would be ready to see the person sitting next to you empowered to do what they want. I don't know how many of us would be happy to see our children empowered to do what they want. And we probably have a feeling that there's a little work required on their wanter as of yet. And frankly, I would have to say that for myself. See, I'm still in the process of growth and development. And that's what God is bringing us to. So while it is true that God desires to be seen, he isn't obvious to this world. He isn't obvious to this world. I take you to a story in Mark 4, one of my favorite stories is the story that you find in Mark 4 uh, where the disciples are having trouble with the ocean. That can be a lot of trouble, can't it? Not a trouble. And uh, there's a storm in verse 35 of Mark 4 and following, Jesus says, let's go to the other side. Often where our biggest storms come when we are following the leading of Jesus. You know that? He comes and he finds us in a comfortable position. He says, let's go to the other side. Hmm. Uh, maybe it's cancer. Maybe we come under attack. Perhaps we have a problem in our family. And he says, let's go to the other side. See, Let's go to the other side. Well, that's a challenge. So they left the multitudes and took him, took, uh, him along with them, just as he was in the boat. And there arose a fierce gale, and the boat was about to sink. It was already filling up. And this Jesus fellow, I guess he was just sitting there sleeping while the waves were rolling over him. If the waves were breaking, breaking over the boat and he was in the boat, I guess they were breaking over him and he was sleeping. See, what, what kind of vision is that? And of course they get concerned. And you see where their heart was because they come to him finally and wake him up and say, Teacher, don't you care that we are perishing? Forget the boat. <laughs> We're perishing. Don't you care? Wake up. Now what's interesting here to me is that he was sleeping but also that he says to them in verse 40, after he rebukes the waves and the wind. You see, they had faith in Jesus, but they didn't have Jesus' faith. You understand what I'm saying? They had faith in him. They waited for him to do something, then they got a hold of him. and said, you do something. You're supposed to fix our circumstance. And he said, why were you afraid? How is it that you have no faith? And in the other passages in Matthew, he uses that favorite word of his, oligopistoi. And oligopistoi, <clears throat> probably the proper English translation of it would be not heads. <laughs> oligopistoi, little faiths. Little faiths. What, what do you suppose they said to one another? I mean, 
you know? Probably, that's what they said. <clears throat> you see, Jesus knew that he was in a God-permeated world and he could sleep in the storm and he could wake and minister because you see to him the world is open. One of the things you'll notice as you read the Gospels is that Jesus' baptism, the heavens opened. The heavens opened. Now what that means is that what's there all along became manifestly present to him. You see, he knew that God filled the heavens and the earth. There's no place that God is not there. That God fills the heavens and the earth. And he could be perfectly safe. And so he slept. And he says to us, we're perfectly safe. Why do you worry about your life? Why do you worry about food and drink and clothing and so on? He says, God will take care of that. You have much more important things to be concerned about. Why worry about tomorrow? What people are going to do? What's going to happen to me? Am I going to get sick? Am I going to die? All of those things. He says, don't worry about it. Don't worry about it because God is in control of your life if you have given yourself into his hands. But someone says, that isn't terribly obvious. And that's true, it isn't obvious. And it isn't obvious because God calls us to seek him. Listen to these words. If with all your heart you truly seek me, you will certainly find me. Jeremiah 29, 13. Again, he who comes to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Hebrews 11, 6. And of course, we all know the verse that we've heard last evening. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Those go together. They don't come in separate packages. The kingdom of God and his righteousness come together. And everything else will be added. Now, you know, we, we have to make up our minds about Jesus. We have to decide whether or not he really knows what he's talking about. And that is not something that is easy for most of us because we hear messages coming from all sorts of other quarters. There's not a single field of expertise in our world today that involves a knowledge of God. Now think about it. You don't have to know about God. You don't have to know about the kingdom of God to be a doctor. You don't have to know about that to be a teacher. You don't have to know. If you're being credentialed in any area from plumbing, actually, in some quarters, to preaching, you don't really have to know about God. That's not a requirement. See, that's the way the world comes to us. That's why teaching such as, as we always are hearing the discussion about evolution, that's why it's really so important. It isn't because it's just a biological theory, uh, because if that's all it were, it would not matter very much. Uh, but evolution is presented as a way around God. It's presented as a solution to the problem of what this world is all about. It's presented as a picture of who you are and who I am. That's why it's so important. Because it pulls the vision of God out of our knowledge and says, you can be as well educated as is possible and not know anything about God. Now, I hope that helps you see, that helps you join the issue. Because that really is the issue. 
is whether or not we live with the knowledge of God. Romans 1, 19 through 20, because that which is known of God is evident among men, for God made it evident to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made, so that men are without excuse. You see, that's the comeback of a theory which says, oh no, everything just popped into existence. Jesus' teaching lies on the side of saying that God is the source of everything, that God is truly alive. You know, we like to make a lot about this, this saying, God is dead. You hear it over and over and over. Ian Wilson just recently published a book called God's Funeral. And it reminds you of that report, you know, of Mark Twain, who was reported on being dead and sent back a telegram to America that said, reports of my death have been greatly exaggerated. You think about it. Now, if God was, is dead, he must have been alive. <laughs> but if he was alive, it's very unlikely that he died. <laughs> the reports are he's not the sort of being that would run out of gas and sort of give up and disappear, you know, right? But it doesn't make a lot of sense. Uh, God isn't dead. God is alive. Jesus comes with that message, and we have to make up our minds about Jesus. The real challenge is to put Jesus in his rightful place as not only the one who made everything, but the one who understands everything and knows everything, who is in control of everything. He understands things better than anyone else because he made it. He runs it. He's in charge of it. And when Jesus speaks to us about the nature of the world and says, we don't have anything to worry about. When he says, if you put your life in the hands of God, you are perfectly safe. And I'd like to just, I've said that two or three times now, and I want us to just marinate our minds in it a little bit so that each of us will bring that home, that it is perfectly safe for you to be here. It is perfectly safe for you to be who you are, where you are. God, indeed, is taking care of you. And you say, well, but the boat is about to sink. Yes. You see, what Jesus, one of the things that Jesus was uh, reproaching his disciples for was their thought that if their boat sank, it was the end of the world. It wasn't just that they should have had confidence that the boat wouldn't sink. It was, it was okay if the boat sank. You see? And now with that, we touch on one of the deepest parts of the human psyche and body, and that is the issue of death. And because we don't hear what Jesus says, and we don't understand that he's really in charge of things, and we don't accept that in the depth of our being, we're constantly worried about death. See, Jesus comes to us and says, those who trust me and my word will never die. And you have to think about whether or not you really believe that. And I invite you this afternoon to consider it carefully. Are you planning to die? What do you think is going to happen to you? And I want to say to you, on the authority of Jesus, that if you have placed your trust in him, what you think death is going to be will never happen to you. That very person you are, that experience you are, is going to continue right through the time when others who are looking at you from this side will see that your body has stopped functioning 
and you will continue in that life into the presence of God and you will see the world as you have never seen it before. You will begin to be in a position where as Paul says in 1 Corinthians 13, we shall know as we are known. What he means there is, we shall know then as God knows us now. Now you think about that because you have to understand that Jesus took away the fear of death which always holds human beings in bondage. He abolished it. So now there isn't any place that you, as you trust in him and believe that he is who he was and who he is, there isn't any place that you will be separated from the loving care of God. Do you remember what Paul said about that? Nothing can separate us from the love of God. Nothing. And then he goes through a fantastic list that includes life and death and all of that. So Jesus was not nuts. He knew what he was talking about. And if we had time, we could go further into those matters and talk about all the things that he knew and all of the things that he was in charge of. He was the master of matter. He could speak to the weather and change it. He could suspend gravity. He could transform elements. He could transform lives. He laid down his own life and took it up again. So now that's where we're living, folks, when we come to put our confidence in Jesus Christ and bring him down to the level of our lives as a whole and trust him with everything. And now when we come to that point, then the idea that God wants to be seen becomes very important. God certainly wants to be seen. We see him coming into the garden with Adam and Eve in the cool of the evening, walking in the garden searching for Adam. God is a God of love and love wants to be known. It wants to be seen. It wants to be experienced. We know that in human life from little children all the way up. Love does not want to be hidden. It wants to be known. The tabernacle of the meeting that was devised in the wilderness was a rather tacky little place if I may say so. And you can read about it in the book of Exodus. But when you come down to Exodus 29, 44, and 46, you see that it was entirely an arrangement that allowed God to have a place where he could meet and abide with the people of Israel. That's God's love. And Paul speaks about how the God who said, let light shine out of darkness, has shined in our hearts to give us the knowledge of God, the light of the knowledge of God in the face of Jesus Christ. And when Philip in John 14 says, show us the Father, Jesus says, have I been, you, been with you all this time and you haven't recognized me, Philip? See, God seeks, he wants to be known. He comes to us, he comes to us in our lives. But you know, the thing about God is he's like you and me in this respect also. He doesn't want to show up where he's not wanted. Do you like to go places you're not wanted? I don't know of anyone who does. And that's where the seeking comes in. Here's what the seeking part is all about. The seeking part is about wanting God enough to pursue him long enough for us to change so that when we find him, we can stand it. Now you may think, well, what's, what's there to standing it? Listen, you know, God is something incredibly great. Incredibly great. The, the teaching of the Bible, no one shall see God and live, is simply because of the greatness of God. The greatness of God is so great that if you were to be able, if you confronted it without the appropriate preparation, it would destroy you. 
How close could you get to our sun, which is 90 million miles away? Well, look, our sun is just a very tiny part of what God is. I mean, he created that and so much more that your mind can't grasp it. And so God has to prepare us and lead us and send out things that we can hear and receive that will cause us to grow on. The deepest question you see is, what do we really want? Do we really want God? Now, you know, I'm not just talking about a thought or a wish or a good idea. I'm talking, do we thirst for him? I would just ask you today, would you describe your attitude toward God as one of thirst? Would you describe it as one of hunger? We need to think seriously and carefully about that. Because you see, God wants to be wanted. He's like people or persons in general. And when we want him, he says, we'll find him. If with all our heart, we really seek them, then we'll find him. And remember now, the seeking is not wasted time. Because in the process of seeking, we grow to where, when we find him, we will be able to stand it. And that's important. Because you see, when you really find God, you are going to be transformed. And there's going to be in you a quality that will be very outstanding and very unusual. I don't know if you've ever thought about that word glory. But the first three letters spell glow. Glow. And there is a radiance. There is a radiance to those who have found God. When Moses came down off of the mountain, they had to put a lampshade over his head so they could talk to him. It's like these lights up here are worse. I mean, imagine talking to a very bright light bulb. That's what Moses was like. You know, when Jesus said a city that is set on a hill cannot be hid, he was, hid, he was talking about people who have learned to live in the kingdom of God. So much of our talk is without effect because there's no reality in it. And when the reality comes, you often don't have to talk. St. Francis sent his people out two by two. Indeed, they were not an order of preachers and they were not supposed to preach. And you've heard that saying many times, of perhaps of St. Francis, who told them to go out and manifest the love of God to people, and if necessary, use words. But you see, they went out two by two so that they could love and serve one another before the world to testify to the reality of the kingdom of Christ in their hearts. And when that comes, you will have power. Now, I don't know how much power. I don't seek power myself, really. I'm, I'm willing to have power if the Lord wants me to do that. I don't seek it. I don't know how much of it I could stand. If you raise someone from the dead at this meeting, word is going to get out. And very likely you will have uh, some television cameras coming to your door. And then you have to decide what you're going to do about your new status. Because it will change your life. Now the question is, can you stand it? Can you stand it? And the next question is, are you prepared to seek the Lord who wants to be visible in such a way that you can become one who receives that 
and one through whom he becomes visible. Can you think of yourself in that way now? As one through whom the Lord becomes visible. Because God wants to be visible, and his chosen way to be visible is through people. That's you and that's me. We are the ones through whom Christ chooses to be visible. And when people see Christ in us, they move towards confidence that this is a perfectly safe place for them to be. And we can talk ourselves blue in the face about it, but until we bring the reality of it, until we can manifest the confidence and love and strength that comes from abiding in the kingdom of God, very little of it will move over to others. And frankly, it isn't primarily just to move over to others. It is for us to live in. It is for us to be a part of Christ and to share his life and to have that reality in us no matter what comes and no matter what we see in the visible world, whether it's the storms breaking over our ship, it's our family breaking up, our children failing, because we don't run their lives, whether it's disease or madness or whatever it is that comes our way, whether it's just the overwhelming wounds of a past that all human beings in some measure share. No matter what it may be, we will be able, as Moses did, to endure as one who sees what is invisible. And you know the great verse in 2 Corinthians 4, from which Renovare takes its name in the Latin version. Paul talks about how the outward man is perishing day by day. But on the other hand, the inner person is being renovaried, renewed. And it goes on to say, while we look not at the things that are seen, but at the things that are unseen, God wants to be seen. And when we seek him out, he becomes, increasingly he becomes present to us with all of the force and vivacity that we have in our awareness of the sense-perceptible world, and more so. And we see God in everything because he does want to be visible. I included in the flyleaf of the divine conspiracy these words of C.S. Lewis. And they're the words of Uncle Screwtape, you remember, the senior devil that is advising his, um, his protege in devilment. And uh, he says to his protege, Wormwood, you must have often wondered why the enemy, that is God, does not make more use of his power to be sensibly present to human souls in any degree he chooses and at any moment. But you now see that the irresistible and the indisputable are the two weapons which the very nature of his scheme forbids him to use. Why? Because God, who wants to be seen, waits on us to seek him and pursue him and desire him to the point to where he alone is what we desire. And then it is safe for him to fill our lives with his tangible presence. You see, he does not overwhelm. He does not bully. He waits and he calls. And when that time comes, then we see the wonderful vision of a person who is living with God present visible, seeable, real, beyond anything in this world. Then the boat can go down. It doesn't matter. 
because we know we're safe. A couple of years ago, I was in Kenya briefly speaking to some people from Wycliffe Bible Translators, and there was a couple there who had lost two sons to malaria in one week. And your heart sinks to even think about it, because we all know what that means, of course. But I wish you could have seen them, and you would have seen how God was visible in someone to whom God was visible. This woman told how they got the boys back here to Michigan, to hospitals which had the best possible treatment, but you know how malaria is. Sometimes malaria, there's just nothing you can do about it. And uh, as the husband took one son to another hospital to try some special treatment, this lady was staying in the waiting room as her boy lay near death. And this woman said very simply, she said, I decided that God was good. No matter what happens, I decided that God was good. And those boys died. They still have a daughter left. They're remaining faithful in their service. That really isn't it because people can remain faithful in their service and be filled full of loss and bitterness and anger. This man and his wife were beautiful cases of the radiance of Christ in a person who has learned to see that Jesus was not a nut and to know on the basis of their own experience that God is in charge. That nothing lies beyond his care because we live in a world that is permeated by a loving Heavenly Father. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Dallas. Thank you. Is Marty Ensign here? Come, Marty. I'm going to ask Marty, this is spontaneous, she doesn't know, <laughs> if you could tell us the story of Bignoni, and you may have shared it in your workshop. You may yep. need to hold that. Okay. That's fine. I, I want Marty to tell this story. I happen to know the story because I know some of the parties involved. Uh, and then after Marty tells it, we want to have a little experience in which George, I'm going to ask him to play on his violin. I want to say a word about it, but first, I just want you to hear as a reflection on what Dallas has just taught us about the safeness of the world in which we are in and how God is with his children even in the kinds of things that we call some of the great tragedies of life. Uh, how God is there in that and how safe it is. Can you tell that? I'd love to. Yeah. I thought of this when Dallas was talking because Bignoni was a friend of ours in Central Africa. Our Burundi people are not very musical. If they sing in a quartet, they have to memorize each part by so fa, re, and then come together, and hopefully they all get started on the same key because it can be bad. But Bignoni had a gift of music. In fact, his name means little bird. And he loved to sing, and he even invented a few little musical instruments like a little homemade guitar because he couldn't afford to buy instruments. He was a leader. He loved Jesus. He just shone. And he went to teacher training college at Kivimba near us, and he became the president of the student body. And you know, in Burundi and Rwanda, we're having a lot of trouble with tribes. You know that, don't you? The Hutus and the Tutsis are just at each other. It's like maybe Hebrews and Arabs back for generations. And Benyoni was middle class. He was Hutu, but he was such a leader. And uh, he helped us get the music going for a radio, Christian radio station, Radio Kordak. And, and uh, he loved to lead the worship team at the teacher training college. And he went on, graduated with honors, became a teacher. It wasn't very long until he was what we would call for his grade school the principal. He was the director of the school. The tribal fighting escalated. 
and one day a band of soldiers came to his school. He was in the office and they said, come out, we've got a list here. There were five soldiers and a young lieutenant who was leading them. They said, call your teachers, we're going, Bignoni maintained his sense of humor and he said, you know, I haven't been one bit political. He said, I haven't even mentioned the president. I mean, <laughs> they said, call your teachers. He had, happened to have 11 men teachers, called them out of the classrooms, told the children to remain. They started following the soldiers up to get out of view of the school and and one little teacher just fell apart, Mariko, Marcus. He just, he started sobbing and he turned to the soldiers and said, kill me first, I can't stand to see you hurt my brothers. Benyoni stepped up and said, no, I'm your leader. He's going to take my life first and you're going to see how glorious it is just to walk into the presence of Christ with no more suffering. Then he turned to the band, little band of soldiers and he said, would you let me pray for you? Our people are very superstitious about death and they could hardly take it in. And they said, okay. <laughs> and the teachers, they got all encouraged because they had a lot of faith in Bignoni's prayers and they thought, he's going to pray for us and God's going to get us out of this situation. You know, the boat's not going to sink. So Bignoni started praying and he did pray for his teachers. He prayed that God would keep them courageous and that he'd take care of their families, but he spent most of his prayer on the soldiers. He just prayed, God, you know these men are going to do something that they're not going to be able to get away from. It's going to haunt them. Please send somebody to them to tell them about your love and forgiveness so they don't have to live with the guilt of this. Soldiers nearly dropped their rifles. <laughs> they had never heard anything like this. They had a little, we call them Inama, a little meeting. They said, what are we going to do about this? And the young lieutenant looked on his list and he said, we've got orders and we've got to carry them out or we're going to get it when we go back to the army camp. Okay, herded them on up the hill, 12 men, got up on top of the hill, Bignoni turned to the soldiers and he said, would you let me sing to you? They said, uh, okay, <laughs> and maybe you have, do you have this hymn, Out of My Bondage, Sorrow and Night, Jesus I Come, Jesus I Come, Into the Glorious Hope of Your Light, Jesus I Come to You. He sang through the first verse. When he got to the second verse, his teachers were getting courageous and they all lifted their voices with him. So there were 12 young men standing on that hilltop singing the praises of God clear through verse 1, 2, 3 to the fourth verse. Any of you remember what the fourth verse is? Out of the fear and dread of the tomb, Jesus I come, Jesus I come into the glorious light of your home, Jesus I come to you. When the notes died away, that beautiful hymn, the soldiers picked up their rifles and they killed every one of those 12 Christian men on the top of the hill. Now don't you wonder how we got the story since they killed all of our friends? That night, well I had a Quaker missionary friend in the town nearest the army camp in Gitega and he said that band of men came in town, they just went to the nearest pub, they got as drunk as they could, as fast as they could to wipe it out of their minds except that young lieutenant who didn't take a drop and that night, as soon as it was dark, like Nicodemus, he went by dark to the Christian Literature Center where an old Quaker missionary couple, in fact, she had been born out there and spoke the language, called them out in the shadow of that cedar hedge and said, would you please tell us about your God? I've never seen anybody face death like that. I want to know and serve that God. And Esther Choate, in a gentle way, led the young man into a forgiveness of sins and the joy of knowing Christ. And he went back to the army camp just exploding. You know, he was telling everybody about 
forgiveness and grace and how it was to know God and walk with him and he started Bible studies and I can't even tell you the end of the story because they finally shot him to try to keep him quiet but you know something by then there were hundreds of them that were serving Christ in that camp and the Lord Jesus said I'll build my church and he'll do it whether the boat sinks or not he's just going to take care of every one of us and go ahead building his church and his body amen as they're gathering uh, allow me to say just a word by now you've uh, caught that we have these general sessions and people actually speak and so on and uh, you might want to preserve those words in your heart of course but also on a tape this is technology, you understand. Uh, and you can order those tapes. And the word that was given to me that it would be important to order as early as possible, they would like to have those tapes ready for you by the end of our session on Saturday so that you may take them home. If uh, the order comes in too late, they'll be mailed, and that's an added postage expense. And while we love to support the U.S. Postal Department, uh, I think it would be nice for you just to take them home with you. So uh, that simple word to the wise. And then a second thing I just wanted to mention, Dallas. Uh, this book, now with this title, it's called A Devout and Holy Life. The actual title is, or the original title is, A Serious Call to a Devout and Holy Life. Now, you understand that this is a marketing decision to leave out that serious call. Because most uh, books today that might even, I mean, if they even come close to dealing with the issue of devout and holy life, well, I mean, they could be titled something like a frivolous call to a devout life, you understand. But this is a very serious book. Now, uh, it was written a while back. Yes. <laughs> and Alice, in a minute, I'm going to have you say something about this book. But I just wanted to say, we worked hard. They've done special drop shipping of this, and they're in the bookstore. This is a $7 book, but we are presenting it for you at this conference for $3. I hope that every one of you can get this book, because there is nothing like this book. Now, it's a bit, uh, I mean, the English is a little older, isn't it? Mm -hmm. And say a word about it, will you, DW? Best thing about this book, is the concreteness of it because it is nearly 100 percent discussions of ordinary life circumstances for people who are shopkeepers or ministers or mothers daughters sons it's about how people uh, can manifest both the frivolous the um, pointless uh, vanity of human life and on the other hand, how they can, in all of those circumstances, uh, manifest the kingdom of God. It opens with a wonderful line. It says, anyone explain to me why they should be devout when they pray, I will explain to them why they should be devout in everything they do. It's a wonderful expression of some of the deepest teachings of the Christian church and the Christian gospel. Uh, and although the language is a little older, I think you're going to recognize people you know as you read it and you might just think that this guy has been reading your diary uh, because you might suspect he was talking about you I sure did I knew he was talking about me a wonderful wonderful treatment now I did not I did not tell Dallas I was going to ask him to make a comment about this how many of you if I just ask you to make a comment about that could quote the first sentence of the book. Can you say, can you give us that sentence again? Uh, well, it isn't word for word, but it, I think it's pretty close. <laughs> it sounded good if to anyone me. will explain to me, William Law says, why I should be devout when I pray, I will explain to them why they should be devout in everything they do. That's not simple. Yeah. Let me see how close I got. <laughs> Now, that, if, oh, go ahead, no, go ahead. Um, no, not so close. They not may, so close. Actually, may, I didn't get the first sentence. Okay. They may, they it may, comes a little further down the page. Okay, that's what. But that's you'll find right. it. It sounds wonderful. I'm, 
That, uh, I want to just bring this question. I want both you and Marty to work on this because it's a very, very important question. It applies directly to what was said here. Uh, this person says, I want to promote the kingdom in all I do. And I've heard Dallas say that, that it doesn't matter if you're a ditch digger or a theologian to accomplish this. I struggle with this personally. I recently finished an internship at a hospital as a chaplain. Marty knows about these things a lot. She's worked at hospitals. Now I am back, though, in my job, punching numbers into a computer, computer programmer. I felt like I was promoting the kingdom as a chaplain. Now I struggle. How do I promote the kingdom in front of a computer screen? How do I accept this place where I am right now? What disciplines can I practice to help? Please help me both with my idea of what it is to promote the kingdom, no matter what I do. Marty? Would you like me to tell a story? <laughs> I'd love it. I'd love it. No. Uh, I think the best concept that I have is the fact that if Jesus were me, and he was set in front of that computer screen to do a job that maybe was odious and not even interesting and good, how would he react? I'm sure he would use time to communicate with his father. He would make sure that in all his contacts with the people in that office, he was cheerful and optimistic and full of hope. And if it's a if it's a matter of just the time that's set in front of the screen, I know that can be very isolating. I haven't had to do it, but I know people who do that, and it's very isolating. But that's only a part of your life, and there's a lot of other hours in your day that you can really interact with people and shine. Now, let me, can I just add to that? Now, this was pre-computer days, but I did do that for a period of time in a task it was pen to paper with no one around for eight months. I took communion every morning that I did that task because I was reading at that time uh, De Cousade's book, The Sacrament of the Present Moment, and I wanted to experience the finger on the pen to the paper, or you can translate the fingers to the keys to the screen. How I could do that as a sacrament before God, and then type with all my might, and do the best to the glory of God. Hmm? The, there's a phrase that is often used in Catholic devotion, offer it up, offer it up. If the work you're doing is good, if it's not, trust God to get another job. If the work you're doing is good, then offer it up to God and look to see his manifest blessing in it in such a way that the good that is accomplished through the job, whether it is for your family or for just for the company you're working for, whatever it is, that that good could not possibly be achieved through human effort alone. And involve God in your work in that way, in addition to the things that both Richard and Marty have said. And if you will do that, you will see yourself co-working with God. What God is interested in is much less what comes out as a result than the persons we become as we do the work. And the opportunity to do anything that creates what is good is of God and we should expect his cooperation in it. And when we see his cooperation in it, no matter what the job is, and I realize that some jobs are pretty tough, and you know, I haven't been on easy street all my life. I've, I've been down the line. I know what it's like to, to work at unpleasant jobs. But I know that there is no job that you cannot see the presence of God. Now, Dallas, that leads immediately into, a, I feel, a very important question. All of them are lovely and helpful and teach us as they challenge us. But here's a person who writes, and this is an honest writing. I've been desiring spiritual depth for the years. I study, I pray, I seek guidance of a mentor-like believer. 
I don't seem to see God at work in me at all. What is wrong with me? I would really challenge this person to go back to their basic understanding of the good news and try to see whether or not their vision has caught up with what Jesus taught. You cannot replace vision. Effort and devotion and all of these things have to follow vision. And vision has to come from the Word of God under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And what I would encourage any such person to do is to stop trying so hard, to back up, to ask that God would make known his vision for their lives, both now and forever, and open themselves to the words of the Gospels, the Gospels in the New Testament, to see what the Lord will give them in the way of a vision. I think vision is what is needed in a case like this. It has to come from God, but you can open yourself to it and seek it through the words of the gospel. Now here you're speaking of the primacy of the gospels. Yes. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. I really believe that. I think now, this is where we miss it. How, why is that important? Why the primacy there? I mean, why should we focus there? Well, because they present the kingdom of God and Jesus more clearly than any place else in the scriptures. Um, and the, and how, how do we do that? One person had uh, asked about our own, your own uh, experience of scripture and prayer. Mm -hmm. Do you pray and read the word of God daily? How do you do it? Uh, you know, a person feeling very uh, unhappy about their own experience. And how do we get started, maybe, is a good question. Uh, well, you know, um, there are days when I run, and I'm not worried about that because I know that Jesus is with me. Uh, I don't try to make a um, law out of every day doing this, that, or the other. But on the other hand, when you look at the larger units, like a week or a month, I try to make sure that there are times in those longer periods when I am able to be alone and to be silent and to deeply study and meditate and listen. Mm -hmm. And I find that that is more helpful uh, than, uh, than just a, a little drop of, of something daily. Um, I use the figure that if you cannot, uh, that you can never get a shower by one drop of water every five minutes, no matter how long you stand there. <laughs> You need, uh, you need a lot of it at once. <laughs> and so that's what we have to plan for, really. And I learned that by experience, see, because I came, well, not the part about the shower. I, don't, I just figured that out. <laughs> We're just trying to visualize you with one drop. <laughs> now, I, I found by experience, uh, I'm, no, I'm just looking back, I know the Lord led me in it, but I found by experience what it was like, for example, to take a whole afternoon. I remember one Saturday afternoon in particular that I was in college, and it was holidays, and there's no one there but me, and I was able to just spend the whole afternoon reading the Gospel of John, and rereading, and meditating. But it's amazing what that will do for you. Yeah, that's lovely. You know, last night, when we saw that dramatic presentation on the Sermon on the Mount, doesn't that speak to you about this? It is possible to memorize. Mm -hmm. It is possible to do that. And now I mean for you. And let me just say in response to that question, for me personally, memorization is, is a very big deal. I don't memorize verses. I remember I memorize passages. Uh, and one that I like to recommend to everyone is Colossians 1, 3, 1 through 17. You memorize that. That'll set your hair on fire. Even for those who are bald. Yeah. It, it does it, something. <laughs> it does work. Or all, 1 Corinthians 13. Memorize mm -hmm. the whole thing. Yeah. yeah. Larger passages. And indeed, one of the things I've learned about studying the Bible, it's better to read large passages and reread them, take a, take a, a week and try to read uh, the New Testament twice. You have to plan on it. 
it has a you you will experience an effect like you've never known. Yeah. Uh, uh, Emily and Gail, could you come up? I'm going to ask. We've been talking about how we bring all of this into the warp and woof, into the press of real life, and uh, I'm going to ask these three from our team to each pray for all of us in our living. Uh, prayerful living, where we are. I don't mean praying, helping us to pray while we live and what we do, but that our whole living at the home, at work, with our children, uh, all of these things that there might come, and you may want to pick up areas of our lives that you can pray for. Would that be okay? The three of you, however you want to do it. Thanks. Hello. Well, the computer image that was given in the earlier question engaged me so because I spend so much time at the computer. So I would like to pray for everyone here to see the Lord in the work itself, for a particular vision of God in the work, yes. uh, in the brush stroke, in the, in the, key, in the hands on the keys, uh, on the screen, and beyond that in the ideas that flow over the screen, and other kinds of work, manual work, carpentry and so forth, historically perhaps we more easily see uh, that the Lord may guide our hands in the work. Because the Lord will always, if we let him, guide our hands in the work. And I want to pray for a depth of understanding of that, to flow over everyone here, to be strengthened in the work that he or she does, and to do it with some rejoicing, even though it takes effort, and it isn't always a happy experience to exert effort, nevertheless to be exalted in the work, running and leaping and praising God. I'd like to pray right now for, um, I'd like to lift up the people in the audience who have been so distracted by so many things, the stuff of life, details, so many commitments, time pressures, and have not been able to center in, to be quiet, to remember the verse in Zephaniah that, that it tells us that, uh, that God will calm us with his love, that he will give us calm with his love. Father, I ask you in the name of Jesus to um, lift film off of eyes where there's been a smoke screen, almost like cellophane, something preventing intimacy with you because of all the clutter of our lives and all the compulsions and all of the uh, immediacy of demands that have kept us from seeing clearly that you love us whether we're good or whether we're bad, whether we're at work or at leisure, whether we are mothering or whether we are marketing. Father, thank you so much that your love is around us, with us, in us, through us, available to us every minute of every day. We thank you, Father. Help us to have a new realization and to lift the film off our eyes that keeps us from seeing clearly that you care about the details of our life. Amen. And Lord, just to continue this prayer that Emily made for those who work, that they see you, and that Gail has prayed that eyes will be open to all the possibilities in the kingdom of God. I pray now, Lord, for those who are struggling, for those who are in the heat of a battle, spiritual or emotional or physical today, and need a special inspiration, a special vision of you. Oh, Lord, open our eyes to how much you care and how present you are with us in every one of these hard things. Send out your healing spirit now, Lord, 
to touch each life and lift them up. And Lord, I just pray that we'll go from this wonderful session this afternoon where we've been taught so beautifully and heard music that lifted our spirits and that we could go out with joy and victory in your presence. In Jesus' name. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all ye church near below. Praise Him above.